Well, thank you, Leo and the praise team. Can we give it up for them? We're so grateful and blessed to have them every single week. Uh, Thank you guys for being here on a special Labor Day weekend. Those of you that are tuning in online that can't make it but are watching, we're so glad that you guys are watching through technology and social media. Uh, My name is David Doyle. I'm one of the pastors here on staff, and I'm uh, super excited and grateful, humbled uh, to bring God's word with you uh, this morning. And so uh, hopefully, as we've geared a couple of weeks now, uh, kids are now in school, rhythms are now taking place, hopefully. Uh, We have two kids that are back in school already, but our our four-year-old is not yet back in school. He starts later this week, but I have a picture I want to show you. His name is Owen. Um, Yeah, he's uh, super cute, but don't let that cuteness fool you. Uh, I am super glad that he will be starting school this week. Uh, And uh, out of the house, uh, thankfully, but he's four and a half. And did you know, I did not know this, I had to look it up, but I I know that he's above average. The average four-year-old asks 450 questions a day. Like I said, he's above average. All right, so I'm, I'm super glad that he's about to start school, his cuteness overload, but dad, 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 it's just a lot of questions. But a lot of us, even as we grow up, we still have a lot of questions. Now, it might not be 450 voiced, but we have a lot of questions, and, and in fact, questions is a part of everyday life. We come into this room No matter what stage of life, family dynamic you're in, we have questions. Questions about life, questions about the next, questions about family, questions about jobs, questions about you name it. We have questions that we give to God. We have questions of doubt. We have questions of fear. God, where are you in this season of life that I'm in? Can you hear me? Are you available? I feel like you're isolated from me. You're like on this island somewhere. There's, there's a disconnect questions. But in fact, God tells us and, and Paul tells us in Philippians to cast all of our questions onto God, petition them because he can take them, we can't. And so through the good questions, through the bad questions, through everyday life situations and circumstances to cast everything onto Jesus because he cares for you. Nothing catches him by surprise. In fact, Jesus would then go into the New Testament. We see in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And did you know that Jesus asked three times more questions than people asked him? Questions. Now, why would Jesus, the Savior of the world, perfect, all-sovereign, all-loving, all-knowing, ask more questions than people would ask him. And the reason that is, is because Jesus really wanted to get to know the heart of the people. And by asking questions, it dug deeper and deeper into who they were and the encounter that they can have with Jesus. Questions is a part of everyday life. Now this morning, we're not asking questions that we have towards God, but in fact, in in change, we're asking questions that God gives us. In this sermon series kicking off today called Questions that the Bible asks of us in this series, our purpose is not to ask our questions, but as much as it is to ask the questions that God considers of asking us. And for the next six weeks, we're gonna tackle six questions that God gives us throughout the Old Testament, New Testament. Now, there's much more questions 
that God asks us, but just six weeks, that we're going to move into this as a church, both in our central venue and in our north venue. And our prayer over the next six weeks is that we ask questions to God, but we seek that God speaks through us in his questions, that we allow the Spirit to move in such a way that not only transforms our lives, but that we gather in this place together for corporate worship and we leave these doors and we're sent by a purpose for a purpose to radically transform our whole area for Jesus Christ. And so this morning we dive into the very first question. And so if you have your Bibles, I know it's going to be on the big screens behind me, but Genesis 3. If you have your Bibles, Genesis 3. Now, I want to recap a little bit of the first two chapters in Genesis. Genesis 1, we see that in the beginning, God. This is very important that we see in the very first phrase of the Bible because we see this. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about us. It's not about us coming into this room and hearing the songs that we want to hear and the passages of Scripture that we want to see. And God, what can you give me and feed me? And it's not about you at all. It doesn't say in the beginning, David. It says in the beginning, God. We are here for one purpose only, and that is for God. God is the author and creator of everything. And our main responsibility and main task and purpose in this world is to know God. And that's why it starts out that way. And then we see Genesis 2. We see the amazing creation story. We see Genesis 1 and 2 and God doing all kinds of crazy things and speaking the world into existence, the beaches, the mountains. Like it's impossible to to look out in this world and not know that there is not something bigger than yourself. We're not even in the scripture yet, and we see God's majesty and power. We see the sky, we see dark, we see light, we see all these cool things. We see God creating man in the image of himself. We see that the relationship was so unique and so perfect That as God created animals, he would bring them to Adam to name. How cool would that be? Eh, That's a giraffe. That's a dog. God, I know you didn't create that cat. That was from the serpent. (laughs) I'm just kidding. But just that perfect relationship. Where it was intended to be. And then we get into Genesis 3, what's referred to as the fall. And so I want to encourage you. I know you received a worship guide when you came in this morning. I I know it looks a little bit different than in in the past weeks. But I want to encourage you over the next few moments to write some things down. Our goal is that we can come together, have a couple of takeaways that we can ask questions and dive deeper into what God is speaking into our heart, into our minds this morning. So Genesis 3, starting in verse 1. It says this, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the tree in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. I want to pause right there, and if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. We have a real enemy. First thing I want you to see as we dive into this passage in Genesis 3, that we have a real enemy. Now, in the beginning of Genesis 3, you see him named or classified or identified as the serpent. 
That is Satan. Satan is real. Satan is an enemy. And Satan is very dangerous. Here, he's compared to a serpent, but in Revelation, at the end of the New Testament, he's referred to as a dragon. In 1 Peter, he's referred to as a roaring lion. And in fact, in John 8, he's referred to the father of lies. We have a real enemy, church, and the main goal of the enemy, Satan, is to steal, kill, and destroy your life. And his whole goal in life is to take you out. He's not a pushover, and he's not someone to be taken lightly. You must be careful not to give him a foothold into your life and a foothold into your family's life. We have a real enemy, and we must be prepared and ready for his tactics in our lives. Which leads us to the second point. Not only do we have a real enemy, but we are tempted by his lies. We are tempted by his lies as we continue to read verse 4, Genesis 3. It says this, but the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree, the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. And so we see there, the enemy is coming up with a strategy of temptation, scheming to make something that looks good in our eyes, more delightful. That, that maybe for what someone said, God as bad, the enemy turns it and makes it look good. And he schemes and he de de deceives and he divides. And once we believe in this lie, it gives Satan a foothold. Now notice, she had to believe the lie before she ever sinned. It started with a temptation, with a lie, which led to a sin. Now, there's two lies that Satan tempted Eve with, and he still does this to us today in this way. And the first thing is this, sin carries no consequences. That's what the serpent, that's what the enemy wanted to do. To let Adam and Eve know in this context in Genesis 3, but he also does the same thing with us today, no matter what you come into this room with. That sin has no consequences. You will not die, he told Eve. Every one of us has felt that lie before. God tells us not to cross a line. Because the consequences are disastrous. He knows you because he created you. He created you in the image of himself. He has a purpose for your life, a plan for your life, to give you life to the fullest, to have joy that you can not experience from the world, but only through Jesus Christ. But what Satan did was question the goodness of God. In Satan's lie right here, he was alluring Eve and then us today that God is holding out on you and he's holding out on us. He doesn't know what's best for you because if he did, then you wouldn't feel this way and you wouldn't have this in your life. You would want to move as your heart moves. Noticed Eve thought it was good for food. It was a delight to the eye and it was a desire to be good. Sin carries massive consequences. 
Ravi Zacharias, author, theologian, said this, that sin has massive consequences. Sin will take you further than you want to go. It will cost you more than you want to pay. And it will keep you way longer than you want to stay. In this world that we live in, our society and culture, the world will tell you that sin has no consequences and be free to do with whatever you want. It was a lie from the very beginning in Genesis 3, and it's a lie that the enemy still uses today. It starts with one lie and one compromise from the enemy. But we also see the second lie that he shared with with Eve and, and Adam, and it's this. Not only that sin doesn't carry any consequences, but that humans can become equal to God. Notice it says, when you, when, he says, when you eat this fruit, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, the irony in this is that God intended for us to share the world and to share creation with God. To walk side by side in, in a relationship and, and for us together to be used That's why this process of of sanctification in our life to be more like God, that when God comes back, that we're once going to be with him, ruling and sharing with him. But the lie of the enemy was to try to take God's place, kicking him off the throne altogether. The great lie was not necessarily eating the fruit And in fact, nowhere in scripture, nowhere in Genesis 3, does it even refer to as an apple. Genesis 3 says the fruit. But the great lie wasn't of Eve eating the fruit. The great lie was humans wanting to be God. It was us, it was you wanting to take God's place on the throne. Don't trust God, be your own God. It sounds like this today in our society and culture. Follow your own heart. It's your life, do with it how you want. You believe in this truth, and I believe in this truth, and it seems to what's good for you is good for me. Or we're all going to end up in the same place at the end of the day, so really a lot of religions all end up to God. And the enemy is very good at scheming and dividing. God is not a God of confusion. And so the enemy lies and tempts in such a way, remember in the very beginning of Genesis 3, he was crafty and more different than the other. He finds a way that is bad and turns it to good in your own eyes. And when she believed the lie, the delight in the eyes and the desire, sin came into the world. Not only do we have a real enemy that wants to steal, kill, and destroy your life. He's like a roaring lion. He's a dragon. He's a serpent. He's the father of lies. He will make you believe that sin has no consequences. And at the end of the day, he wants you to dethrone God from the top and replace him with something else. But number three, we're broken people. Because of the temptation of a lie, a small compromise, something that seems so small that we all come into this room broken people. Look what it says in in, in verse 7. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed, sewed fig trees, fig leaves together, and made themselves loincloths. Now notice, nothing was different about 
these couple of verses. They, Adam and Eve were naked before, and yet they were unashamed. They thought everything was good. They were created to be in a perfect relationship with God, walking side by side with God. They were naked before, and they were not full of shame. They were not full of guilt. They didn't even recognize. But now, now they are exposed. And watch their attempt, watch man's attempt to try to fix the solution. We do this today, in, 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 even in, in our day, in our society and culture, we try to fix things. We try to cover them up. And so man's attempt, they, they try to tie together fig trees and made themselves loincloths. Trying to earn, trying to fix, trying to attempt to make things better. This is the whole culture of religion that you have to do, that you have to work, that you have to attempt. But it's a temporary fix that doesn't permanently solve the problem. Then they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. We know that this is not Lake Charles, Louisiana because of that. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. They were created to be in a perfect relationship with God. Walking side by side with the creator. God giving Adam responsibility and naming things and Everything was perfect. Why would they not run to God in their problems? Run to God in their mistakes. That God is a good father, that he knows what's best for us as individuals and in our trouble, in our distractions, in our mistakes. Why would it not be wise and make sense for us to run to him? But instead, they hid themselves. And we still do this today. A couple of days ago, four and a half year old Owen got mad, threw a toy at the TV, and it broke. And he hid himself from me because he knew I was going to be so frustrated. Our natural instinct in our sin, in our shame, in our guilt, in our fear is to hide ourselves from the presence of God. But why? In our sin and our shame and our guilt, shouldn't that be the number place we want to be? But because we have a real enemy and because we're tempted by his lies and because we're allured into him that deceives us, the sinless nature, the brokenness of who we are, that's our instinct is to hide ourselves from the presence of God, the shame that we have in our lives of past decisions, past mistakes. We all have past chapters and past things that we wish we could go back and take, take back and do things over. And as a Christ follower, hear me, church, the enemy has no authority over your life. The only thing he can do is to scheme, divide, distract you into thinking that you're not good enough, that you're tied to your shame, that you're tied to your guilt, and you've got to hide from the presence of God. The number one thing the enemy can do in your life and in my life, because we are broken, but then look, but the Lord God called to the man. Why did he call to the man? Because the man was not being the leader he should have been in the first place. 
God called man to lead families. And one of the reasons we're seeing a lot of families that are falling apart, because we just, if you haven't been here in the past couple of weeks, we just finished a series on the family and relationships and spouses. And if you haven't been here, I would encourage you to go back and go to YouTube, go to our, our website and watch those messages. But that's the number one way the enemy can tear the home life up is to divide the husband and wife. That 60% of Lake Charles students, kids, have divorced parents. And he called to the man because he said, men, where are you? Where are you? What were you doing? You were right there. And you allowed this to happen. And he said, where are you? The first question in our six-week series, you can circle that in your Bible, you can highlight it, you can put it at the top, whatever. Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave me to be with me, she gave me the fruit, and then I ate. So he says, listen here, God. This woman, it's her fault, and more importantly, it's your fault, God, because you gave this woman to be with me. So ultimately, I'm blaming the woman, and I'm blaming you. I can't take responsibility for myself. Is this any different in our culture today? Absolutely not. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And then the woman said, well, it's the serpent's fault. She, he's the one that deceived me. I don't even like snakes anyways. He's the one that deceived me to get me to do this. It's not my fault. I blame him. In our culture, we continue to do the same thing. In our mistakes, in our sin, in our brokenness, we can't take responsibility for ourselves. We like to put it off on other people. It's their fault. It's the enemy's fault. It's my family's fault, the reason I'm this way. It's my sibling's fault. It's my spouse's fault that we got a divorce. She wasn't meeting my needs in my relationship. We play the blame game over and over and over again. But God says, where are you? Where are you? God never asks questions because he doesn't know the answer to it. In this moment, he wasn't calling to Adam to play a little game of hide and go seek. Which is a kid... I loved hide and go seek. It was one of my favorite games. I was small and I could maneuver in and out anything and nobody would ever find me. Uh, our kids like to play this game now. We play it ever so often. Now the kids are getting really good. And in fact, sometimes, no judgment, we like to hide in difficult places because it gets us alone time for a little bit. <laughs> so we love hide and go seek. But this wasn't, this wasn't a game of hide and go seek. This wasn't a sense of God not knowing where Adam and Eve were. God is all knowing, God is all powerful, God is all sovereign. It had everything to do with something was lost. At that moment, something was broken. Something was disconnected. The, the, what they had before, it, it, it seemed like something was just, it wasn't there anymore. The power of sin, the power of, of this 
big, big thing in our lives that disconnected us and the perfect relationship that was had was now gone. And at that moment, in that moment, sin came into the world and because of that first sin, we are all broken. We all come into this room broken. It doesn't matter if you've come into this room and you've made one mistake or if you've made thousands of mistakes like myself, when you put that next to perfection and God, you will fail and lose every single time. We all come into this room with sin. We all come into this room with shame. We all come into this room with a past. And what you struggle with might be a little bit different than what I struggle with. But one thing that we all have in common is that we are all broken. And it separates us from a perfect savior. And there has to be something that restores us back to God. There has to be. The purpose of why he created you in the first place was to know God. And because of that temptation, because we have a real enemy, and because of that temptation of the lie, we are all broken. And the last thing I want you to see is this. But we have a great Savior. God goes on to explain their penalty for everyone, every punishment, because sin has consequences. It has consequences. God promised that eating from the tree would lead to death. And he was right, emotional death, relational death, environmental death, spiritual death, and even physical death. Sin demands a sacrifice. But if you hear anything else this morning, I really want you to lean into the next five or so minutes because I believe this next five or so minutes can radically change your mind and your heart through the spirit of God because we have a great savior. And I don't know the situation, I don't know the circumstance that you bring into this room, the the, the difficulty the doubt, the fear, the shame, the guilt, the worry, but two words that can radically change wherever you're at, and it's this, but God. But God, just input but God in in everything. In Genesis 3, verse 21, you skip over a couple more verses. It says this, And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. What man attempted to cover up and to temporarily try to fix, God intervenes and permanently fixes it. This is the first sign of blood that we see in the Bible. Something then and there had to die to cover the sins of Adam and Eve. Last thing I want you to write down is this. The first blood in the Bible is of our God making right for our mistakes. From then on, we see this theme of blood all throughout Scripture. Genesis to Revelation, this one word, blood. Where there's blood, there's purpose. Old Testament, because of sin, because it demands a sacrifice, there had to be blood to pay for the sin. And they would get a lamb or a bull and they would sacrifice that, a lot of it from the day of atonement and all throughout the Old Testament, you would see this temporary fix to try to solve the solution and it was good for a part time. And so the end game in the New Testament, which is the reason why we see Jesus referred to as the great lamb, would be the ultimate sacrifice for your sin. His blood was sufficient for everything. A one-time sin payment on the cross was sufficient for your past, your current, and your future sins. 
Where there's blood, there's purpose. And God would come down as flesh in the form of the son named Jesus that would ultimately pay for everything, to restore what was broken, to make a way. You are broken, lost, without hope. You're not even looking for God, but God. In Genesis 3, God sought after the man. You bring nothing to the table. In your sin, in your shame, in your guilt, you're not looking for him. You're hiding from him. And that's why salvation, salvation has nothing to do with you. Has nothing to do with your works. It has nothing to do with your prestigious family dynamic. It has nothing to do with what you do in your work environment. It has nothing to do with you. You bring nothing to the table. But that God was love. That God intended to be with man in perfect relationship and sin came into the world and divided it and broke it, that God would go back to the man to restore what was intended to be. This is the gospel. This isn't a New Testament concept. This is a Genesis 3 in the very beginning concept. For the broken, God is the healer. For the hurting, God is the comforter. For the orphan, God is the father. For the sinner, God is the savior. For the lost, God is the one to follow. For the lonely, God will never leave you or forsake you. He is truly all in all. And I don't know where you are in your relationship with Jesus Christ this morning. I don't know if you're here for the very first time or I don't know if you call Trinity your home church, but this is what I do know. God knows your name. He loves you with everything he is. He created you for a purpose, by a purpose, and he wants to restore and give you joy only found in Jesus Christ. The question God is asking you is where are you? Where are you? Why are you hiding? Why are you listening to the lies? And maybe for the first time this morning, you need to put your faith and trust in Jesus. You've been trying to do it on yourself. You've been trying to fix it. You've been trying to to temporarily make it better, but it all seems to be worse. And the only way salvation can come into your life is for the first time you put your hope and trust and faith in Jesus. And maybe for the first time this morning, you need to do that. Maybe you are hiding from God in a, in a, in a, in a different situation, circumstance. Maybe you're going through something that's a struggle. Maybe you're questioning God. Maybe you're you're doubting God. Maybe you have fear and worry and anxiety. And what God encourages us is that God is everything that you need. And you need to bring it to the table and just say, God, will you speak to me? God, will you use me? And we have some amazing prayer warriors this morning that just want to simply pray with you. And so I want to ask every head to be bowed, every eye to be closed.